For those who are new to the college, uh, and I, I, I know we have some high school students here, I wanted to say um, welcome. And for friends of the college, uh, faculty and staff, and our own students, uh, welcome. It's good to, good to have you here. Appreciate you taking time from your day. Uh, the college is quiet. Um, finals ended uh, last Friday. Uh, obviously, our Learning Commons project, Building 19 in the background, uh, continues along. We're very excited about that. Um, but uh, it certainly is a, a lovely day, a wonderful day on campus. I'm very pleased for us to have this conversation with our Commissioner of Higher Education. And we'll have a panel after uh, he offers the presentation. But let me, uh, let me give an introduction. Uh, Dr. Carlos Santiago is our Commissioner of Higher Education for Massachusetts and was appointed to this position by the Board of Higher Education in 2015. Working with the Board of Higher Ed, he is responsible for providing overall direction to public higher ed in Massachusetts and helping shape state level policies that maximize the benefits of public higher education to the Commonwealth and its citizens. Dr. Santiago joined the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education in 2013 as Senior Deputy Commissioner for Academic Affairs and his uh, past academic appointments have been uh, many, including Chancellor of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, uh, Provost and COO for the University of Albany, and he was a tenured faculty member and brings over 30 years of experience in public higher education uh, and is the author or co-author of six books and numerous other publications that focus on economic development and the changing socioeconomic status of Latinos in the United States. He holds a PhD in economics from Cornell University. Uh, please join me in offering a warm welcome to our commissioner, Dr. Santiago. Thank you, President Cook. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today and to spend some time. I've gotten to know the days of the week by the universities, the colleges and universities that I'm at. So Sunday was Framingham. Yesterday I was at Framingham. Today it's Stick. Tomorrow it'll be Middlesex. And Wednesday it'll be Holyoke. So I will be coming back on Wednesday uh, to these, this part of the state. Uh, this is a great opportunity to talk about higher education, both public and we can talk a little bit about private higher education in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but the truth is we are in perhaps the most challenging times for higher education that I've seen in 30 plus years uh, in the academy. So first, uh, I'm going to run through a few slides uh, about what we're doing uh, from the perspective of the, the campuses and the department and the board of higher education so that you get a sense of what our focus is. And we have a mantra at the Department of Higher Education and it's called Students First. We, um, we are a regulatory agency, but we're also an academic policy uh, organization. Uh, we work with our three segments, our community colleges, 15 community colleges, nine state universities, and five UMass campuses. Um, and we are advocates for students in many respects and advocates for the campuses as well. Uh, affordability is something that is very important to us and we've been working with all of our uh, institutions to make public higher education in the Commonwealth affordable. We advocate for funding um, and we're uh, also very much focused on closing gaps and I'll talk a little bit about that as, as we go forward uh, because I want to talk about some of the demographic changes that we're seeing not only in Massachusetts but uh, uh, across the nation and in uh, the New England states. And student success is the third uh, leg of our um, of our priorities. Um, so, when we put our students first, uh, we foster a much more integrated system of higher education, something that a, a theme I will be returning to as well. We elevate the performance on key uh, outcomes, uh, and we do oversee uh, all of the data that comes from the campuses. We have it centralized, and we send it back to the campuses so they see how they are performing relative to other institutions, particularly within their segment. We are very much engaged with K through 12. Uh, early college uh, and dual enrollment are important components of, uh, of what we do. Uh, 100 Males to College, for example, the Springfield Consortium that has 100 Males to College is also a very important connection with the K through 12 world. Um, we're working on a number of different initiatives with uh, the new uh, uh, Commissioner of Elementary and Secondary Education, Jeff Riley, as well. 
Uh, we highlight higher education, public higher education. When I speak about public higher education, I remind the audience, because uh, many of them are uh, not like you that come from the world of public higher education. Many of them come from the world of private higher education. And what I tell them is, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts today, the majority of the students that go from high school into college as undergraduates go to our public institutions, not our private institutions. And in fact, uh, uh, those that go to our public institutions largely stay in Massachusetts. So when I talk about the future of the state, uh, and I talk about the future of this innovation economy, it has to come, from my perspective, from our public institutions. We have wonder, we are blessed with private institutions, among the most renowned in the world, but it, the, really the engine for uh, Massachusetts will be uh, its public institutions. We want to inc in incubate innovation uh, at all levels uh, throughout the system as well. So here are a few of the strategies we use. Uh, early college, and we have early college designations, and we, we want uh, um, as many early college high schools to, to arise. And it really is, we're focusing on low-income students in those early college high schools, uh, students that are first generation in many case, uh, cases, students that really need exposure to college. And I go back to the days when I was in Washington, D.C., heading up the Hispanic College Fund. And um, we would have these summer bridge programs where we'd bring high school students to the campuses. And I remember we were at UCLA uh, one day, and we had just bussed in um, uh, students into, uh, into the summer program, and they really didn't want to be there. Uh, the first thing we did was take away their cell phones. They really didn't want to be there. <laughs> um, but there was this young man, young Latino uh, male, um, who was uh, sitting down apart from everybody else, looked pretty miserable. Uh, and I, I went up to him and I said, how do you feel? Uh, aren't you excited? And he, he looked at me and he said, you know, I don't, college is not for me, he said. He said, I don't see myself in college. And to me, that was um, just eye-opening uh, because the first thing I thought is if you don't see yourself in college, you will never get there. The first thing to do is visualize yourself in college, and that's what that program did. And that's what we hope early college to do, uh, will do, and the 100 Males to College program as well. Uh, we've worked with the campuses to create a Commonwealth commitment. We've created the first time, and I think this is really crucial because the Commonwealth commitment uh, relies on this, a transfer system. So for the first time, um, we've been working on it for four years, you can take courses, both uh, courses in general education courses or courses in your major at any of our public institutions and in 40 different majors you can transfer those courses and they will be accepted by any public institution. There was a time longer than four years ago when in fact our private institutions were more readily accepted the credits from public institutions, our two-year campuses, uh, and we have uh, turned that around. We are, our board will act on major changes to financial aid. We are, in effect, uh, centralizing financial aid. Financial aid in Massachusetts is a maze. It is 31 different programs. We don't even understand all the programs that we have. It is a hodgepodge of different earmarks and, and other uh, particular programs. We want to centralize it. Massachusetts ranks about 24th among the states in the amount of financial aid that we give. It's about $100 million. Sounds like a lot. Kentucky, a state our size, gives three times that amount. The amount that we fund per student is small. We rank among the 49th, we're 49th among the 50 states and the amount of funding that we provide, the wealthiest state in the nation. So we don't give uh, 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 a lot of financial aid to our students. We give drips and drabs to a lot of students as opposed to uh, trying to make it an effective system. So we have work to do. Online learning is another area that we are uh, expanding and, and looking at, working with the campuses. Uh, strategic planning, we are doing a whole new measurement system called the performance measurement system as well, something that we are statutorily required to do. So this is now where I get to the presentation. <laughs> Here you have a graph, and remember I'm an economist, so I love pictures <coughs> of numbers, but <coughs> the problem with this graph is that I have not identified what they are. And I usually start uh, by asking the audience, so what does this represent? And let's take the, 
the, uh, uh, the uh, downward sloping line a bit, the one that is uh, in, I believe it's in red, I'm colorblind, so forgive me, but that looks red to me. <laughs> May not be. It is, okay. Um, so what do you think that is? This is people. We're talking about numbers of people. So here we are between 2010 and 2035, numbers of people. What do you think that downward sloping line is? Just shout out what you think it is. It is traditional college going students. <laughs> Pretty close, good. <laughs> Have you heard this presentation before? <laughs> um, that number is going down. It's going down quite dramatically. It's going down nationally, but it's really going down in New England, uh, and it's going down in Massachusetts. Traditional college going students. That's what that number is. Does anybody know what the upward sloping line is? What was that? No, it's not. It, it's actually, um, good guess. <laughs> the upward sloping line is the Massachusetts population aged 55 to 65. These are the folks, I include myself in that group, these are the folks that 10 years from now, and this is the most educated of our labor force, is going to be leaving the labor force. So this is the, this is the dilemma that Massachusetts faces. We are a state that relies on brains over brawn. We are an innovation economy. We are the most educated state in the union. Over 50% of our population has some kind of post-secondary degree. All the other states are trying to catch up with Massachusetts, and yet we are faced with a pretty significant crisis. And in fact, if you look at the surrounding states, look at Maine, where Maine's population is plummeting. Maine has now taken its public systems, has not closed any campuses, but has consolidated. And its campuses, Maine, the Maine system of public higher education calls itself one university. Look at what's happening across your border in Connecticut. The 12 community colleges have now been consolidated into one. There are a lot of change occurring across the nation in terms of consolidations and, need I say, mergers and closures and all of that fun stuff that not only is impacting our public institutions, but all you have to do is open the paper and look at the news and you will see that campuses are closing. The Mount Ida situation, which we are responsible for the closure plan, everyone thinks, oh my gosh, this is the tip of the iceberg. This is, this is the one that is now flagged that this is a crisis. Well, the truth is, over the last five years, we've done 15 Mount Ida's. You haven't read about them because those institutions have notified us in time for us to create the, path, the pathways for the students to transfer to other institutions. So they don't hit, they don't hit the Boston Globe. But this is going on and this will continue. Our private institutions uh, as well as our publics are under duress. Quincy College, its nursing program has now had to close. It's had to close. Uh, it, the accreditor closed the program, not the institution, but the nursing program. We are seeing a lot of stresses. Our, and I'll show you what our numbers look like. They look like that. This is up to fall 2016, so it's a little outdated. But as you can see, in community colleges, we peaked in 2010. And to tell you the truth, we know that the community college enrollments are countercyclical. When the economy is weak, as it was in the Great Recession between 2007 and 2009, enrollments boomed. When the economy is doing well, people, students will generally drop out and go uh, find work if they're not already working. So, uh, and, and this is, you know, the state universities are flat. And UMass, while well, UMass will continue to say that they are growing, that they are growing, scratch that surface and you will see, yes, they are growing with international students and out-of-state students. And it's an important distinction because we are interested in Massachusetts' future uh, as well. Not that international students and out-of-state students can't contribute, but they by and large leave the state after graduation. But there is growth. There is growth and decline. And let me give you some numbers that I got this last week uh, from high school um, in Massachusetts. Between 2003 and 2017, uh, the number of uh, Massachusetts high school students that self-identified themselves as white declined from 2003 to 2017 by 28,000. 
fell by 28,000 students. We were fortunate, however, that there was some growth. And the growth is in places like Springfield and other of our gateway cities. And the growth is occurring among ethnic and racial minorities in the state, particularly among Latinos. At the same time, over that 2003-2017 period, the white students in our high schools uh, were declining by 28,000. They were growing among Latinos. They were growing by 23,000. And if you add the growth, it's much smaller, but growth nonetheless among African-American students and among Asian-American students, the net growth in Massachusetts over that period of time, 2003 to 2017, was about 9,000 students. We only grew 9,000 students over that extended period of time. And that is really uh, a concern. So there is some growth. Uh, that growth will translate for, for Latinos in particular. In 2002, uh, they were 6% of the high school population, the white population, white student population was 82%. Uh, by 2032, that number will shift. The white student population will drop to 56% and Latinos will grow to 22% within the schools. So it's a challenge because we know that these populations that are growing have been the least served in education, not only higher education, but early childhood education and K through 12 education, they have faced tremendous gaps. And the gaps we see along the spectrum, we see gaps in, we could go back to childbirth. Birth weight, there are birth weight gaps by race and ethnicity that exist and are reflected in third grade reading scores, 10th grade MCAS scores, college going rates, college graduate, I mean high school graduation, college going rates, college admission rates, college success rates, college retention rates, those gaps impact all of our students coming from underserved populations and those students are coming to our public institutions. 70% of Latinos and 70% of African Americans in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts go to our community colleges. So you are the front line in ensuring the success of these students and closing those gaps. Because the gaps are also uh, um, uh, reflected in, the, in the, the low attainment rates that we see. So this is how these gaps looks by institution. And we all have work to do, as you can see. Um, this is something that I presented to the, the, the board. Um, and some of the, you know, their outliers like Berkshire and Greenfield which have very small populations of Latinos. Uh, so I kind of, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 those are not the, the, the pressure points in terms of, of success that we, that we need. Uh, but this is where we, uh, where we stand. Um, this is the success rates and the, uh, uh, the, the gaps. We would all love to be in that high success uh, 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 category uh, and small gaps. And that's what we strive to. And our institutions are changing. We're having more Hispanic serving institutions joining us all the time. Springfield, Salem, Holyoke, uh, looking at Worcester's change as well. Our demography is changing and we have to be prepared for that change. This is how it looks in terms of the, um, the state universities and UMass campuses. That was worth uh, pointing that out uh, as well. So, We've got our work cut out for us. Uh, I think it's important work. Uh, it's work that we need to do. Yesterday at Framingham, when I was talking to their graduates and giving the commencement address to their graduate students, I said that it's not only their future that we are concerned about. We're concerned about the future for the Commonwealth, for our children, and for our children's children. We have to continue to be, if we are going to be the innovation state, if we're going to be the state that's gonna have the highest income per capita, if we are going to be the state with the highest level of educational attainment of its population, we have to take this reality that we're seeing and we have to convert it into success. We have to bring students in high schools, bring them to have a college experience before they apply so they understand what college is like. If a student completes a dual enrollment course or an early college design course, 
that student will have the confidence to go and to succeed in college. All the data show us. All the data show us that that, that can, be a, a, can change the lives of these students. We have to change remediation. Remediation, which is somewhat of the, the dirty little secret in Massachusetts that we do a great job graduating students from high school, but 30% of them need to remediate. And everybody accepts that. I mean, the commissioner of elementary and secondary education and I talk about that uh, often. That is a challenge for us. We cannot do remediation the way we've done remediation where we create a gate and we tell students, claw your way over that gate and you will be successful. And take this remedial course. It's not gonna be count for credit, but you gotta pay for it. And when you finish that one, take the second one. And when you finish that one, take the third one. And by that time, there's nobody left to take those courses. It's a system of failure. So we've changed it. We've now implemented co-requisites across our campuses. Uh, we have implemented changes to the placement of students into remediation. We have to solve remediation. It was the first statistic that I saw when I came to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and I was horrified. Because it showed that in 2000, I think it was what data was I looking at, 2014 data, it showed 12,000 students had come into our community colleges needing remediation. And two years later, after they started, less than 2,000 actually passed those uh, first uh, credit-bearing course. So we lost 9,000 students or so from that one year. We cannot afford to have those losses. We cannot be, be losing 9,000 students. And we track students. We know, where the, we know where you go after you leave Springfield Tech. We know where you're going to work. <laughs> we know what earnings you're going to make. We have a lot of information, a lot of data. And these students simply fell off the grid. They disappeared. They didn't come back to our institutions. So we have some questions. I'm not saying that, uh, that we need to go through all of these. In fact, I'm going to stop shortly and open it up to you for any questions. But we, we have to change how we do things both at the campus level and at the system level. And we are a very decentralized system. And I've worked in centralized system, both in Wisconsin and New York State, very centralized. One board for 64 campuses in New York State. One board for 24 campuses in Wisconsin. Here we have 24 campuses, 24 campuses with their own boards, and then the five UMass campuses with a single board. So Massachusetts has 29 institutions and 25 separate boards. Now, I think local control is crucially important. I think it helps uh, to integrate, particularly the community colleges, to their communities. I think that's very important. But we need to start acting like a system. We need to start doing together, things together as campuses. Competition, for me, is less important than working together, than collaboration across our institutions. That's a different mindset from what we've had. That's not going to be easy to do in the Commonwealth, but I think we have to do something. So there are a number of different questions. I just toss those up for, for your discussion, but I'll be happy to, to open it up for any questions that you might have on this or other topics. So let me stop there. I think we've got microphones. Questions, comments, disagreements, agreements, <laughs> whatever you'd like. This is not a shy crowd. Okay, uh, you want to come up? Hi, sir. Uh, how are you? Uh, how is the Commonwealth uh, going to boost STEM education, science, technology, uh, engineering, math? Uh, you know, coming from in our country. Uh, my impression is that, you know, in, in this commonwealth, as in other U.S. states, uh, math phobia is pretty <laughs> pandemic. <clears throat> there are a number of initiatives that we have to promote STEM. Um, one, uh, each of our 15 community colleges participate in the STEM Starter Academies. And the STEM Starter Academies is something that was um, the idea of Speaker uh, DeLeo, who actually has put in over the last four years, over four and a half million dollars into it. It's one of the biggest investments that we've made. It's about 16, we're going on 20 million. 
And the results are phenomenal. The results are hugely important, both in the, uh, the number of students that are, have joined the STEM Starter Academy and their continued interested interest in the science and mathematics. Students that came to the institutions with very little interest in those disciplines have now increased their interest in our, in our majoring, majoring in them. So it, it's gotten much more uh, important. And their performance, their performance is, um, is much stronger as well. And if you look at what they're doing, it really is what we should be doing for all students. It's providing support networks, it's bringing them to campus, it's dual enrollment credits, it's all the things, the kind of support services that we know help students succeed. And we need to focus, continue to focus on STEM. Uh, we have to because that's what uh, the workforce is, is requiring of us and that's what um, the Commonwealth is requiring of us as well. But I think what the, the lesson we've learned is we know what it takes to get a student to succeed. We know it takes the kind of wraparound services that uh, many of us had. In some cases, it's your family. You have individuals in your family, particularly individuals who've gone to college, who can help prepare the way, who can teach you, uh, what, you what a FAFSA form is and how you fill this out and how, what does it mean to, to, you know, what's a three credit course versus a four credit course and things. You know, people that can, they can really explain to you what college life is like. That's really, really quite important. But for today's students, and especially for to the students that come to our public institutions, there are other things beyond tuition and fees and support services, and we are seeing increasing need among the students that are coming to our campuses. We are seeing hunger on our campuses. We are seeing homelessness. We just did a survey. Massachusetts is the first state to do a comprehensive survey of all of its public institutions. And lo and behold, all our results say we have homelessness among our students. Childcare, transportation, these are issues that impact the success of our, our students. Uh, but thank you for the question on, on STEM. It is very important. We have, we have impacted 30,000 students with that STEM Starter Academy to date. Any other question? Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. As a manager of an ABE program and also as a community activist who's done a fair share of work for the Fair Share Amendment, what role do you see the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education playing in that and exactly how would that money be used? <laughs> Boy, is that a loaded question. <laughs> as a public official, <laughs> I'll give you the party line. Um, I do not lobby. Um, uh, I do not advocate, um, uh, so uh, the, the, the party line is, is basically hands off. We're, we're a state agency, we have to be neutral in these things as we are on, on some aspects of legislation as well. Uh, we don't comment on legislation unless we're really adamantly opposed to something, uh, then we will make that known. Um, but I think, I'll approach your very important question in a different way. I think we do need to have uh, a fundamental investment in public higher education in the Commonwealth. Uh, we are trying to do it uh, through, you know, to, through the financial aid. For example, we had for the first time that anyone can remember, and our financial aid, uh, aid director was here 24 years ago. She remembers that no, there has been no increase to Massachusetts financial aid. That 100 million we have today was here 24 and 30 years ago. For the first time, we added $7 million, and we directed that $7 million to community college students. Entire $7 million. And you should know, of the $100 million, the private institutions get 38%. Okay? Private institutions do, can tap into the mass grant. Uh, so, um, and when I came out with, uh, you know, we got the $7 million through the governor's budget, uh, and I decreed, uh, because I do have the authority on some things, to use it for community college students. Um, the independent institutions said, we, we can help. <laughs> can you give us 38% of the seven million? Uh, and I said, thank you for trying, but no, this is we're directed at the community college uh, level where the needs are the greatest. You had another question? Yeah, I was wondering if you could go back to the quadrants. Yes. 
So, yes. Um, so the larger circles are the ones that serve more Latinx students? I believe so. So I guess I'm curious what you're they're, noticing. They're either, they're mm -hmm. either um, they may not be. They may be just, a, uh, I think they uh, reflect the size of the campus. The size the of the campus. The total number of students, not uh, Latino students. Okay. So what are you noticing in those small gap, higher success rate uh, in that quadrant that could be learned by folks in the other quadrants? Well, um, if you, um, there are a couple things. I'll, I'll go to the state university. Salem has been, uh, Salem State has been identified. It's a Hispanic serving institution that has really uh, promoted student uh, success uh, and really built um, uh, support services for Latino students. They've done things that are, you know, may seem small, but actually are really important. All of their marketing materials are now in Spanish and in English. Things like that uh, that, that have, have made a real difference uh, as well. They've, uh, the, the, the uh, you know, trying to hire more uh, Latino faculty and staff has also uh, helped, helped as well. So among the other institutions, I mean, I, I think all of our institutions do well. I'm a big proponent of our community colleges. I think they do face uh, different challenges, and I think that's somewhat of a reflection when you see in the, in the lower uh, quadrant. Um, for the others, you've got, uh, you know, Bunker Hill uh, is just huge, but actually has done a really good job in, 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 in serving the students. I think each institution, and this is where, you know, while I talk about systemness, while I talk about our 24 campuses working together, I don't say, and I will never say, our 24 campuses are all the same because they're not. They're fundamentally unique, and you have to understand the uniqueness of the campuses to understand the, um, uh, the, the, the sort of um, the, the description that we have here. Okay, I may have taken more time than I should have, but anyway, thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Clearly critical conversations and uh, they will uh, share echoes and be familiar to our faculty and staff here on campus. Um, continuing the discussion, I'm gonna invite a couple uh, people who are very well known in our community up to continue the, the, the conversation. Uh, first, I'm very pleased uh, today that we have our Assistant Superintendent of Schools here in Springfield. Uh, Lydia Martinez Alvarez made history when she was selected as the first Latina to serve as Assistant Superintendent. And this is a role she has held since 2012, a first-generation college student and Springfield native. She's a former teacher, principal, chief of schools, and she's dedicated her 20-year career to serving the public school system from which she graduated. Throughout her career, she's been recognized for her commitment to the city of Springfield and its children, and was honored with the Awake Excellence in Education Award, the Barbara Rivera Lifetime Achievement Award, and the Piney Valley Pro uh, Project Change Agent Award. She holds a Bachelor's of Science uh, and a Certificate of Advanced Graduate Studies from Westfield State University. It's the institution at which she now serves as a member of their Board of Trustees. She also earned a Master's in Teaching from Elms College and is a doctoral candidate at American International College. Lydia. Also joining us is Denise Hurst. Hailing from the city of Springfield, Denise has for many years volunteered and worked in human service and community settings, including serving as a victim witness advocate for the Hamden County District Attorney's Office and as the Holyoke uh, Site Director for the Department of Mental Health. She's, a passion she's passionate about social, civic, family, and community empowerment and serves on the executive board of Mother Women Incorporated, UMass Women in Leadership, and as a multi-term elected member of the Springfield School Committee. Denise also serves as Secretary Treasurer for the Massachusetts Association of School Committees and chairs the Minority Caucus. She's an adjunct professor for Cambridge College and her accolades over the years have been many, including in 2015 being recognized as one of the 100 New England women of color. In September 2016, Denise was appointed by the Massachusetts State Treasurer, Deb Goldberg, to Regional Manager of the Massachusetts State Lottery, Western Massachusetts. She's a graduate of U UMass Amherst and holds a Master's in Social Work from Springfield College a resident of Springfield, she and her husband, Springfield City Councilor Justin Hurst, are the proud parents of two sons. Denise. Uh, 
All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to Springfield Technical Community College for hosting this very important event, and to Commissioner Santiago and Assistant Superintendent Lydia Martinez for sharing with us today their time and their talent. I hope that you all enjoy the discussion that's getting ready to ensue. And in particular, I wanna make sure that the students that are in the, in the crowd are listening, because this is really important and valuable information. And so you might not necessarily be seniors right at the moment, but these are things that you should be thinking about. And to the adults in the room, let's be thinking about how we can go back and impact the young people in our community with the information that gets shared here today. So we're gonna jump right in. And so, you know, one of the things that stood out to me when I was listening to you speak and when I've been privy to sort of hear some of the governor's State of the Union addresses and he mentions a lot of the community colleges, there's been a lot of attention that community colleges are getting and in particular free community college. Do you want to talk about your thoughts around that and what you might share for those who are in the audience around the importance of understanding that community college can be free and affordable? Um, I, I think it's, it's in, when you talk about free community college, it's important to understand what exactly is free. <laughs> because uh, even in the, the seven million that I talked about in terms of financial aid, that goes to pay two things, tuition and fees. And we know that the costs of education are much higher. But what, uh, what that does is it allows for students, largely Pell Grant recipients, but students with an income slightly higher than the Pell Grant level, uh, to find 100% of their unmet need paid for with those financial aid dollars after all the other financial aid has covered their, their expenses. So, so it's, it's free to the extent that it covers tuition and fees. And that's important to remember because students, uh, you know, we're not even including books in, that, in that, that equation, which can be very expensive. So there are other things that we need to do. I think we are moving to that level. This, for the first time, I am hearing conversations with K through 12, and, and we have had a great relationship across the two agencies where we, we often didn't interact as much as we are now. Um, and a discussion of the, the possibility, at least the thought, that an associate's degree is as important as a high school degree was in the early 1900s, and that in fact it should be uh, uh, covered by the state. And I had not heard that before, but I think that's increasingly part of the conversation. Uh, we know the gaps for those that don't have uh, a, a, any kind of college credential and those that do is huge and it's, and it's growing. And so before we move on, if Dr. Cook, do you want to talk about specific strategies or interventions such as the Commonwealth Commitment? Yeah, I appreciate that. And um, people here at the college will know we helped pilot this a little bit with uh, $30,000 bachelors with Westfield State and with Worcester State. Um, really trying to put that cap on things and garner some attention for what we know is the most affordable option. I mean, this is why community colleges carry that vitality with their communities is its access and that affordability, affordability piece. Those are essential. Um, so for us, we've really tried to help to the point around Commonwealth commitment, really showing students come here, uh, declare that pathway. Uh, we can lock in th that tuition fee rate. Um, we are incredibly mindful about things as well like Pell thresholds and so when we do unfortunately need to raise uh, our fees uh, in, in partnership with our Board of Trustees, we're doing it in mind with that Pell. And to the Commissioner's point, how do we also leave a little room for books and technology and the other things that they need? Here, here's a number that really snuck up on us. Um, I did a panel with Christina Royal, the President from Holyoke Community College about a year ago and we talked about this affordability and student debt. Here, uh, what we know is beyond Pell, so beyond grants, student loans, just students at STCC um, saw $4 million in f uh, federal financial aid beyond grants in one year. Uh, that quite, quite a significant amount for what is the most affordable institution uh, in, in, in the region. So that, that's one of the ways that we're thinking about it, but also contending with it. And Assistant Superintendent Martinez, do you, 
Do you want to talk a little bit about what a district like Springfield Public Schools might be doing when we talk here, Commissioner Santiago, talk about K through 12. So before they actually can get there, what's their local school district doing, such as Springfield? Thank you, Denise. I'm glad that we talked a little bit about free college because to us, that is our barrier. It's the money. We're often talking about doing Roman courses. We're talking about doing really innovative things, but it all comes down to funding. And so we're constantly trying to figure out how we can do this dual enrollment. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was at a conference in Chicago where one of the New York um, community colleges, the kids actually graduate from high school with an associate's degree. We can do that. There is no reason why we can't do that. Our children have the capacity. That'll take care of remediation coming in. That'll solve a lot of the issues that are going on if we can do that. But it comes down to affordability. So we continue to constantly look at how we can get innovative to do those things. But it's not by lack of the students being able to achieve that. It's by lack of funding. So, Commissioner, more on you. And so could you, before we transition, could you talk a little bit about are students and families getting that information from their guidance counselors? Is what's, what are some of the strategies that are happening at Springfield Public Schools to ensure that families are aware of financial aid? So we actually have last um, dollar scholarships that are now run by Springfield Public Schools. We also have FAFSA fellows at each of our high schools. And what that means, it's one individual that's dedicated to just doing FAFSA in the schools with our students to bring that awareness. We also have our entire um, guidance department working on college going um, initiatives in the schools with a host of partners that we are actually partnering with. STCC, we have our graduation coaches, our FAFSA fellows, we have YAIM from the YMCA working with us, we have Gear Up, and I could go on and on and on. So it's not by lack of resources, it's just that we really need the parents out there, whoever's listening, to really cooperate with us because the children try really hard, but when it comes down to FAFSA, we know we need that parent information um, to get it going, but we are doing some really innovative things. So students, there's no reason for you to graduate Springfield Public Schools without having had that FAFSA already done with you. Great, great. So we heard a little bit about um, the retiring workforce, the consolidation, the closures of, of different higher educational institutions throughout the Commonwealth and throughout the country. We also know if you open up the newspaper on any given day that there are concerns about the unemployment rates. And so when we think about um, economic development and educating our students so that they can fill these gaps, what do you believe are the roles and outlooks for community colleges in playing an important part? Community colleges are at the front line of, of all this work. We, we, there's a graph that I didn't put up there that had unemployment rate um, and college completion by cities. And as you can imagine, there are huge, huge differentials in Massachusetts. Uh, if you look at Brockton at one point, you look at you know, Newton at another or Boston, you see very dramatic differentials. And you know, I, I, it's always important to point out that we are an education state. It's our fourth largest industry. We're really drivers of education, not only nationally, but internationally. But there's there the, 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 the other things we need to realize, we are also rank sixth among the states in inequality. So, you know, uh, and from my perspective, higher education, particularly the community colleges, are the great enablers of social mobility in our society more than any other institution, I think, are the community colleges. So if inequality is something we care about, uh, about reducing, then we should start paying attention more to the community colleges, because that's the difference. And a, and a couple of details on that. Um, again, those of us here in Western Mass, we know this. Springfield carries double, just, uh, give or take, the unemployment rate of the Commonwealth. And yet, I'm also realistic of that that graph and where SCCC ranks in that quadrant. Uh, to me, that's the opportunity right there. The ability to talk about employment and opportunities because we know there are great jobs in this area in key sectors, healthcare, manufacturing, IT, and cyber. So how are we doing and are we doing that at scale? Um, some of the programs that I looked at 
we have a really robust engineering transfer program, 100 plus students year after year. Uh, one of our signature STEM, if you will, put the T in STCC type of programs, 16% female, 19% Latino, Latino. Again, such promise, such opportunity, and we are not there yet, but there it is. Um, also one in the area of healthcare, medical billing and coding, a nice solid 60 students in a, give or, a year, give or take. Um, here's where we show what the promise and opportunity looks like. 90% women, 40% Latino, Latino. So again, if we can match across all of our myriad of programs in that technical area, in that STEM, in that high employment area, we get to really contribute and chip away at uh, some of those employment labor needs. So, so let me just couple that question with, so we know what the un unemployment rates are, and we looked at the quadrants and, and the gaps in success. And so we know that the data says that women, people of color, um, tend or are less likely to achieve their associate's degrees. So tell me what exactly is STICK doing to help close those gaps? Yes, um, so we heard a little bit about the Commonwealth. Uh, I'm not putting him on that. <laughs> <laughs> at, uh, ac across the state. Uh, for me, it's that word that I got in earlier there about how do we go to scale. We have tried a lot of these different interventions. And, and I've been you know, really unvarnished with our college, and we've had these difficult conversations internally. Our graduation rate as a college is about 22%. For community colleges across the US, that's pretty decent. You carry a lot of part-time students, what have you. But for students of color, for Latinx, for African-American students, it's about half that rate. There again is the challenge and the opportunity at the same time. So we've tried lots of different things. Math, right, that real um, phobia, anxiety-driven conversation. We've tried five-day math. We've tried co and things like that. We've not necessarily gone to scale on those types of things. We've not necessarily figured out what is working. We have some sense of it and then invested and moved our budget accordingly. A good example is right now, we have dollars through Title III, which is a federal program, about $2 million over five years. Uh, we are using what's called an SI model, supplemental instruction, and our students themselves are essentially acting as teaching assistants, but they're in about 5% of our classes. How do we take that, what clearly seems to be an effective intervention, and bring that to a far larger scale in a given semester? I think those are the ways that we can chip away at these type of equity challenges. Right. So, I'm just going to shift a little bit because when I, I just heard Dr. Cook end talking about the equity challenges and we talked about, um, I think you said we ranked six with respect to in inequality. So we know that um, the city of Springfield just took in a large number of Puerto Ricans who came from the island because of the hurricane. And so I just want to, as we, we have a, con a conversation focused on our Latinx students, that we talk about what that impact is, or what that's like right now in the Springfield Public School System, and then what we might be seeing in the future as they hopefully transition to a community college or another higher ed educational institution here in the in the Commonwealth. So if uh, you could talk, Assistant Superintendent, uh, about what that has been like for the Springfield Public Schools, and in particular, maybe even the seniors who are coming here, and are we trying to work together to bridge a gap, bridge a path for them to come um, and, and access? So first, um, Springfield Public Schools this year launched a program called the Student Employment Program for Springfield Public Schools to kind of help to work with the community colleges and others to close some of those gaps that we were just talking about in terms of employment for our students. Often Springfield Public Schools is neglected as an employer. And so we've been trying to kind of bring that back to light to have people understand that not only are we an educational institution, but we're also an employer. Um, third largest in Springfield. And so that being said, part of what we've been doing through the employment program is really working with a lot of our area employers to provide opportunities for our students in terms of summer work, internships, 
and co-ops and other types of ways that we can kind of help close that gap. We don't want our students stuck in entry level positions. We actually want them to be able to get in. It's kind of the chicken or the egg. We hear it a lot, you know, well, I can't get a job because I don't have experience. Well, how are our kids going to get experience if we don't give them a job or an opportunity? So really trying to close that gap first. Second, we had 640 students come in from Puerto Rico. And so it was a huge influx to the city of Springfield. And what we were lucky enough to already have in place was those ESOL services. And, and a lot of the kids that came in also needed special ed services. So we already had some of the systems in place. We didn't have enough of the systems because unfortunately in the beginning, the students did not come with funding. Therefore, we couldn't go out and just hire you know, a bunch of people to help us close the gap with our students. But we integrated them right into our buildings. We brought them in and started giving them services from the first day that they entered through our parent and community um, engagement center on School Street, tested the kids right there, figured out their levels, the ones that um, were special education but didn't come with IEPs, we immediately put them in the pipeline to prioritize them based on the law and not neglecting the rest of the kids that we have here in Springfield that need those services. And so for us, we were lucky that um, we have a 65% plus population already of Hispanics or Latinos in our system. And so bringing them in, we already were acclimated to what it was like because we get an influx, not that much, not that quickly, but nonetheless, these are our students, this is our world, this is our reality. And so we were able to really show the kids love from day one. And so even at the parent and community engagement, we made sure that everything was translated for the parents, we made sure that there was access to the parents, we've been reaching out to some of those parents to do a variety of different things with them, including our adult ed program. We really tried to not just help the students, but help the families as they came into Springfield and provide the services that we could. Great. Assistant Superintendent talks about some of the demographics and 60 plus percent of the children in the public school system identify right as Latino or Latina. It's amazing. That to us again is that opportunity. Right now uh, SCCC is about 30 percent uh, Hispanic. Um, so we see ourselves growing and evolving as this Hispanic serving institution. What comes to mind are, are um, some of the workforce opportunities that we've tried to build so that there's an immediacy, there's a quickness, that nimbleness that um, employers sometimes look to the community college to be responsive about. Mm -hmm. We recently did a very short uh, uh, English in the workplace training that we stood up uh, in partnership with MGM. Those kinds of things I think will, will hopefully be very effective right now. Um, but I would say with our faculty and staff here, it's been a tough year. We have a lot of staff that have family uh, in Puerto Rico and in those early days, it was, um, it was something. You could feel the weight here at the college and I think people continue to travel back to hear from families about how this is and what it's going to look like. I know we might talk to the commissioner a little bit about uh, giving his scholarship on that. Um, but even, I'll give you a sort of more macro, one of the things that we hope uh, to offer to uh, our communities of color is that welcoming environment. Um, we talked before we launched this learning, student learning commons uh, about the stick shuffle. When you come here as a, as a uh, interested or a prospective student, you went to potentially 17 different offices in every different building with a different number attached to them. Now we have one roof over all of that. And uh, even just this morning, I was amazed. There was uh, a young woman who was sort of wandering in what we call Building 16 Garvey Hall, the administration building. And you could tell, was not sure on her phone where she needed to be. And so in this case, okay, yes, I'm gonna walk her over and she was there to take her high set, there to take that, that GED equivalency. Um, how do we, again, make sure that that's the experience for every student who comes to our campus? That is a retention uh, effort in its own right. Absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, people tend to migrate back and forth for a variety of different reasons, but when you place obstacles in their way that seem so difficult to overcome, you know, sometimes seeking what you think might be easier just seems, you know, to be what, what folks choose when there are a lot of opportunities here, um, and in particular in our schools, our public school system, and here at Springfield Technical Community College, which is a jewel in our own backyard, um, that you would hope that perhaps um, some of them who have come over might stay and take advantage of, of what we have to offer. Um, 
So Commissioner, if I could, uh, Dr. Cook talked about you being an economic scholar as well as an authority on Puerto Rico. In the book you co-authored, Puerto Ricans in the United States, you offered a nuanced view on the commuter relationship between the U.S. and the island. Would you like to share with us your perspective, especially in light of, of the hurricane? Sure. And uh, uh, the, the, the copy she has in her hands <laughs> is the first edition. Uh, it's now really outdated. Uh, so a new edition, uh, the publisher has, uh, uh, will we'll come out with a new edition in the fall. And I'll be happy to come back and just talk about the book. Um, uh, and, and, and I had to rewrite, as you might imagine, a number of chapters. One um, uh, clearly on the economic debacle that occurred, uh, that started in 1996, but uh, really culminated in 2007, 2009. Uh, the, uh, the island is pretty much bankrupt at, as, as, we, as we know it. Uh, and then if you add on top of that uh, Hurricane Maria, it's been devastation. Uh, uh, you know, the numbers of people that have come to the United States uh, is now, has pretty much reached the levels that we saw in the great migration of the 1950s, which is historically one of the largest migrations as a percentage of the, the, the population that remained. Uh, it remains uh, uh, one of the, the highest migrations. Uh, we have now, we have uh, five million plus uh, Puerto Ricanos living in this country uh, and the population in Puerto Rico is not that at that level and it's going down. It was, it was at you know, three, three and a half million and now it's falling. So in the book we talk about Puerto Rico now experiencing a demographic winter where the population is aging, uh, you know, those, uh, the, the, the out-migration is driving a lot of that. So, I mean, one of the things, I probably should say it here uh, with, with, this, with this group, last year, uh, uh, our board uh, authorized me to provide in-state tuition to Puerto Rican students who were coming, uh, and we did. And we've been in conversation with the campuses to see, do we do that a second year? It continues for the students that signed up last year. And, and what it does, it gives in-state tuition for, uh, for the students at our public institutions. So the question is, do we do it again for new Puerto Rican students that might be coming for the fall term, either you know, going to your high schools or coming here to Springfield Tech? And um, at the beginning, we had very few numbers, and we su it suggested maybe we won't do it a second year. And the numbers have increased. Holyoke has a lot of students. Stick, uh, Bunker Hill, for example. But one of the, the difficulties of doing this is as I kept in contact with colleagues uh, in the University of Puerto Rico system, they would say, we very much appreciate that you are providing in-state tuition to Puerto Rican students that need it, but we want them to come back because they're not coming back. Uh, and that's one of the dilemmas if we continue to make it, <laughs> to continue to, to, to provide these benefits. But we know that the island's infrastructure has not been um, uh, replaced. The island's infrastructure is in terrible conditions and we see it at the, uh, at, at the level of the institutions as well. So we will continue the in-state tuition uh, program for one more year and we will continue to evaluate it year by year. Um, because it's the right thing to do for those students. So with respect to, um, to funding uh, the in-state tuition students for, the in-state tuition for the Puerto Rican students that are coming, um, can we talk or can we talk about what else Massachusetts is doing to fund higher education for, for everyone? Um, President Cook talked about the Commonwealth commitment, and I had talked about the financial aid, the seven million in financial aid. Those are two actually separate programs. The, the, the seven million is open to part-time and full-time students uh, that, um, that are going to our community colleges. The Commonwealth commitment is for students that are going to our community colleges and then on to a four-year degreed institution. But it has more stringent requirements. You have to have a 3.0, you have to have selected a major, um, you have to be going full-time. So, so they're different programs. I think they're, they're, they're um, directed to support students in, in, in different ways. Um, you know, uh, the campuses uh, on their own do so much 
for, for students, and I see it. I see it as I go to the, the institutions. You know, um, if, you, if you wanna know where public education, uh, higher education support is going vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, tuition and fees, they're actually inversely related. And if, you, if the support for public higher education is moving down as it has been, in the Commonwealth for a number of years now, then you see tuition and fees uh, and affordability get, get more difficult. We need an infusion, but one of the things that when I talk about, you know that graph with the, the two lines and that upward sloping line? That's the aging population line, that's the healthcare supporters line. <laughs> and there's 600,000 of those folks that are gonna be retiring, and if you ask them to say, okay, you can vote for support for healthcare, or support for public higher education, where do you think they're gonna vote? So that's part of the dilemma that we face, is, is that we have to be able to make the case for public higher education to be the, dryer, the driver for the success of those that are retiring as well, for their communities in which they reside, and for them to realize they need to step up and speak about an investment in public higher education. We're not quite there yet. So with those dilemmas, is, would you like to talk about perhaps what stick might see um, to, to sort of kind of not necessarily combat, but some ideas around how stick is trying to, to combat some of those same dilemmas? I have two words, and we'll, we'll draw on our assistant superintendent here, but early college is such a critical conversation for us in this respect. It's the idea of demystifying far sooner with students and their families what college going means. Um, for us, uh, the number that we've talked about internal to the college is uh, about a $2 million stake in that early college uh, contribution. We have what's called a College Now program. Area students can come as juniors or seniors and take a course a semester at the college without, without any tuition or fees attached to that. We get only so much money from the Commonwealth. It's about 50,000 a year. We have not put a cap on that as a college. That's not the case for all the community colleges and their budgets uh, carry a, a number of different considerations. We've seen anywhere from a 15 to 20 to 20% carry through. Students who take those type of classes then come with us. That is, again, an invaluable sort of demystifying of what we're trying to do to the point that the commissioner made around how do we integrate and collaborate with K-12. These are those type of conversations, again, that are important, but we also have to go to scale on. So all I can say is we're in. We are in. We are ready to send every single Springfield Public School student to college before they graduate. And so if we can get the resources, and we definitely have the partnership. We've already started talking about that. One of the things that was really telling to me, the more I do research and the more I talk to higher education folks, especially in admissions, is how more important a dual enrollment program is than even an AP course. Mm -hmm. And so we've been putting a lot of emphasis on AP courses, and, and I quote one of my colleagues in saying that that's like a torture, an exercise of torture for our kids. <laughs> making sure that they know all, all the material for the AP um, exam and then sitting there with their nerves all up in a tiffy and taking that exam. But the dual enrollment courses actually gives them the opportunity to see what college is really like and to see how rigorous the courses really are and to see the demand that is put on them, yet they're not gonna have somebody there every day asking them where their homework was and, and checking for their attendance every morning and, and really teaching them some of those soft skills that help our children when they go to college succeed. And so that's what we need. So, you know, STCC, I hope you can accommodate us because I could tell you how many are graduating in two weeks. Um, from Springfield Public Schools. And so all I can say to that is that is the opportunity that we are waiting for. I know that we've been working with other colleges. I don't want to neglect any of my other colleagues. Um, you know, Westfield State University has been a great partner at Springfield Public Schools. Just last week I was at HCC. So the colleges want us. We just need to figure out how to get our kids there. And so let me know what we need to do, and we're going to make it happen. So, so Dr. Cook and Dr. Santiago, any last words or thoughts, anything new and exciting that you'd like to share um, with the audience, and in particular, maybe our, our students that are here visiting? I, I was gonna be a bit wonky. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and I'll give the last word to our, our commissioner. I, I think his book is quite seminal, and, and uh, I appreciate that he'll come back and talk to us about it with, with the 2.0 version. 
um, to try to again tie together the opportunity and the affordability, the access that is our community college with the equity conversation. Um, noting again how central uh, to our Latino student body are Puerto Rican students. I think it warrants our attention. Uh, in 1990, uh, according to the data that I read in that book, um, high school students, uh, people with high school uh, graduates, about 20% uh, lived under poverty. And in 2000, that hadn't budged much. It was about 21% of those people with a high school diploma were still living in poverty. Um, I dare say in 2010, uh, we might see similar statistics in 2020. But for those same uh, individuals living in the diaspora, uh, if you had a college degree and you were Puerto Rican in 1990, the uh, number living in poverty was 7.5%. In 2000, it was 6.5%. Fractions of what that is, knowing education is this critical intervention. For us in the year ahead, uh, we have tremendous opportunities in the area of health science. We're building out a pathway that really gives students the type of experience that will help them understand is healthcare for me because we know it's a tremendous industry with opportunity. Uh, also, just manufacturing. Um, uh, it was so thrilling to know that CRRC, who's manufacturing rail cars for the MBTA, is doing that in Springfield, and they put on that first team that went to China for that training, I think it was four or five of our own graduates. This is the kind of pride uh, in our institution that, that is just thrilling to see. Again, how do we keep that going? That's, that's what we're going we're gonna to keep after. That's great. It's always dangerous to give me the last word, but um, I'll, I'll just say, and I'll reflect on, on what is in the book, um, a little bit and, uh, and the, what we're experiencing here and some of my uh, remarks on higher education. You know, in 1980, uh, Puerto Ricans in this country uh, were referred to as the underclass. And it was very derogatory, uh, but that's how we were perceived of in the media as well as among academics. And, and uh, uh, the reality is that uh, you read some of the, the work at the time and they said basically Puerto Ricans uh, are not following the immigrant path. We are not following the immigrant path. We are not achieving what other immigrant groups had. And uh, that decade between 70 and 80 was, was tragic for Puerto Ricans in, in this country. Uh, it was tragic because New, York's, New York City, where most of them were located, went bankrupt. And Puerto Ricans got the brunt of that. We were the last hired and the first fired. If you look forward to today, you find Lo and behold, a middle class has emerged. All of those aspirations of immigrants are reflected in that community. And the term I use to talk about that community, whether it's in Springfield, Holyoke, I mean, this is a, this is a national uh, look at the Puerto Rican population. It is resilient. It is a resilient population that when we have to leave, we leave. And when we want to come back, we come back. And we will do what needs to do, what we need to do to have our children and our children's children succeed. And education was the key. It was those, those nurses and firefighters and policemen and others who began getting education and started to create that middle class and school teachers and others so that today we actually, no one can say that Puerto Ricans are an underclass. All the data suggests that in fact, after 1980, the income per capita among Puerto Ricans grew at a faster rate than any other group in society. So the book is a different portrayal of a population that was basically discarded in some sense, viewed as a failed immigrant group, and that's not the case. And I think this community is an example of that. This is one of those communities that has been most, most resilient. So I'll be happy to talk about that when the book comes out. Uh, but it, it does, I think, reflect on all the work that we do. Uh, I think it is part of the, the, the uh, American experience. Thank you. On behalf of the college, can we have a warm w welcome and thanks for our panelists today. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.